Okay, I think uh, I think we're all here, and um, thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's event, which is part of the continuing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. We are going into our 25th year now, and our topic this morning: uh, asset allocation for 2020. Uh, navigating the risks, charting the opportunity is our annual symposia for the chief investment officer. And um, so we started um, this session back in 1995 uh, in the days where you needed to give 90 days notice. And so if we were going to get our money back before the December 31st, we had to make our decisions before September 30th. So um, lockups have changed and um, we've all gone to more better liquidity terms. But we still keep meeting and talking about this subject on this date in September. Uh, so, um, you know, having said that, uh, this is our first time we've held a roundtable uh, here at the Greenwich Historical Society. We held a, uh, a town hall meeting here in 2004, 2005 uh, with the leading regulators down in Washington. Uh, we had them up here on this table. And um, we had uh, all the major hedge funds sitting where you're sitting today, and it was sort of a reverse inquisition. Um, and um, you know, th those, were, those were the days uh, when everyone was talking about hedge fund regulation. Uh, so today we're, um, we're holding our first roundtable here because the Bruce Museum is under construction. Uh, so uh, let's see how, how soon we can get back there, or maybe not. Uh, but today we'll hear from two of the most seasoned investors in the business, and I'll briefly introduce them after I say this. The speaker's views are their own and don't necessarily reflect our views. Uh, so having said that, um, Mark Anson is the Chief Investment Officer and Chief, in, uh, excuse me, the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Officer of the Common Fund. Uh, before that, he was the Chief Investment Officer at the Bass Family Office in Fort Worth, the Chief Investment Officer for the British Telecom Pension Scheme in London, and the Chief Investment Officer of CalPERS in Sacramento. Um, Mark's not only a deeply seasoned investor, but he's one of the most prolific educators in the business, uh, having authored over 100 investment articles and five financial textbooks, including the Handbook of Alternative Assets. Uh, he travels extensively, and for the last 15 years, our schedules have never jived. Uh, but today, um, uh, we've got him, and uh, the stars lined up, and we're thrilled to finally host him here at the Roundtable. Uh, Dr. Mickey Levy <clears throat> is an old friend of the Roundtable. He's, the, he's a legendary economist and a colleague to the world's leading central bankers. Uh, he's the chief economist at Berenberg Capital Markets, a German investment bank with roots going back to the 16th century. He's also co-chairman of the Shadow Open Market Committee, a group that analyzes monetary policy uh, of the world's central banks. Before that, Dr. Levy was chief, uh, chief economist at Blenheim and the Bank of America, where he uh, developed strategies and educated uh, um, and conducted research on monetary and fiscal policies. Uh, Mickey's an advisor to several U.S. Federal Reserve banks, and he testifies before uh, U.S. congressional committees on economic and financial conditions. Uh, and today, the uh, moderator of the Greenwich Roundtable is John Griswold. Uh, John is our much beloved chairman and an expert on investment governance and, uh, the, found and, and the founder of the uh, Common Fund Institute, um, and as well as the Endow End Endowment Institute. Uh, and, and their mission is much like ours. Um, it's um, investor education. So uh, please welcome John as he sets the table. Thank you, Steve, our fearless leader. <laughs> we have. Uh, we're blessed today to be uh, here with Mickey and, and Mark because there's so much to talk about and uh, we have limited time. So I'm just going to make a couple of opening remarks then pass it on to these two to begin their commentary. Uh, last year at this session at the Bruce Museum, we, we talked about how difficult asset allocation is and of the things that committees and CIOs and, and private investors do. It's probably the most challenging thing. Well. I would say this year is even more challenging. There are even more challenges in the economic sphere and certainly also in the investment sphere. Uh, so here we are again facing perhaps a little different set of challenges, but uh, formidable nevertheless. Uh, but there are also opportunities, uh, and we want to get to that as well, because one of the things that we do at the roundtable here is try to give people ideas for investment, uh, profitable ideas, hopefully, uh, but give you insights that you really can't get many other places. And uh, that depends on really our selection of speakers and what they have to say. But it's also, I think, the, the combination of speakers and the networking that goes on with all of you. So 
thank you for coming today and being part of this. And please don't be shy about asking questions of these folks, because uh, you have a real opportunity to, to uh, poke and prod and uh, get some insights that you probably won't get anywhere else. Uh, as I say, lots of challenges, uh, the prospect perhaps of, uh, of negative rates that uh, seem to be growing worldwide. And uh, we've got, uh, obviously, a, a valuation question about the stock market, the longest bull market in stock market history in the expansion, uh, very high uh, Schiller P.E. ratio. Uh, obviously, tariffs, trade war, uh, geopolitical problems. Uh, Iran now. Uh, there's so many different things that are that are affecting our psyche. That trying to sort through those challenges is a real uh, task that if any asset allocator has to deal with now, whether they're on a very large uh, institutional basis or an individual uh, investor. So I'm first going to turn to uh, Mickey and ask him to set the table a little bit for us from the economic standpoint and give us some wisdom on that gore. Mickey. Sure. Um, Steve mentioned this is an outlook for 2020. It may end differently than it starts. Um, let me just start and say there are three regimes in the world right now that are dominating finance. The first is China's economy is decelerating potentially independently of the tariff, the U.S. tariff. So China's potential, China's been the driving factor of global growth and trade for two decades now. It's slowing. Its actual economic performance is significantly worse than its official data suggests. The second regime is the U.S.-China um, trade war, call it what you will, it goes way, way beyond trade. It goes to intellectual property, cybersecurity, national and international security. This is, I, I'm in close contact with some of the uh, U.S. negotiating team. The, if it were just about trade and tariffs, um, you could negotiate, you know, over, you know, over drinks at dinner. It goes way, way beyond that, and that's why it's taken so long. Um, but it's not the only pocket where, where trade barriers have increased if you look at, at China versus, uh, uh, um, if you look at Japan versus South Korea or the like. We're, we're in this new regime. The third regime is the negative and ultra low rates, and um, it has big implications and rates are going to be low for a while, and one of the big implications is low um, bond yields push up PEs, okay? Um, and I should have said at the outset, while I'm an economist, I'm very involved in strategies, and, and my, uh, you know, I don't mind being a little outspoken. I would be cautiously long stocks here. Um, if you like to play internationally, um, U.S. potential growth is significantly higher uh, than any other large industrialized country. So if you think about uh, potential profit growth around that, well, well uh, in, in Europe, potential growth is decelerating, and even though they won't admit it. And, and um, you know, then there are a lot of other things going on. But... Uh, once again, we could end 2020 differently than we started. So we have these three regimes. So if you think about it, um, China, um, its, its consumption has slowed, particularly in autos, um, because behind the scenes, what you don't see is, while the PVOC has, has um, been easing monetary policy, um, the, the China Banking and, and Insurance uh, Regulatory Commission has been tightening covenants on bank loans and uh, on, on loans for cars. So auto sales are falling sharply. They're much higher than in the U.S., and this is hammering Germany. And, of course, my German colleagues say anything that goes wrong in Germany, they blame on Trump. But Germany faces major structural problems here. Um, it's not like if you, if you wake up in the morning and have an epiphany, oh, I'm overweighted in the stock, you come in and you sell it. 
Germany spent the better part of a generation building an industrial infrastructure to produce stuff to send to not just China, but Asia. And they're facing a major problem now with declining productivity, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go too far here, but what you see happening is a consequence of China's its, its exports have flattened out, its unit labor costs have soared, its currency is overvalued. Okay, so its potential selling, so its exports are slowed, its imports are declining. So global trade volumes are falling now. They're falling for the first time since um, 2008 9. And this is having a direct impact on Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, Australia, Brazil, Germany. And you can add it all up and reconcile the data as a, you know, even though China's data is not very reliable, you see this slowdown in global growth. So we're in a global industrial slump and it'll eventually end. Um, the U.S. is much better positioned than um, most other countries uh, to, to weather the storm. So once again, the industrial slump, what, what's, what's happened in, in, in a lot of countries, they've, they've hired too much. Now they see a slump in their product demand, um, either by, because of regulations or whatever. They can't cut employment that much or, 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 or their uh, business executives are too slow. And so they're incurring declining productivity and is starting to feed back into their domestic economy. Okay. And... Um, the U.S. is better positioned. Um, the U.S. is in an industrial slump. We have a decline in industrial production, a slight one. Uh, businesses, in addition to facing declining exports now, um, it had to cut back production some to whittle down an inventory overhang. Um, profits are at a very high level, but they've, they've flattened out. Um, but on the other hand, um, U.S. And, and capital spending has flattened out, and so has business confidence. But on the other hand, the fundamentals underlying the consumer are very solid. You have healthy increases in employment, sizable increases in real or inflation adjusted wages. And if you use the PCE deflator like the Fed does to measure inflation, real wages are rising even more. Um, and you have high business conf high consumer confidence. So whereas business confidence has come down, consumer confidence is very high. And one of the critical elements here is worker confidence is very, very high because labor markets are doing well and there's a lot of mobility. And so you know, one of the critical issues here is, you know, you have healthy growth in the consumer and in housing and, and, and solid fundamentals. And the question is, will those remain healthy to offset the, the weakness in uh, industrial production for now? And I'd say yes, but in the near term, I'd say one of the biggest risks is um, if for any reason we get a sharp decline in consumer confidence. But when I ask portfolio managers, whether it's th throughout Europe or the U.S., I ask big portfolio managers what their assessment is of the upcoming holiday retail season, they think it's going to be pretty good. If it's pretty good, then, then we're just fine. What you can expect is a tremendous amount of, of uh, stimulus out of China, which eventually will work. Um, and and um, central banks are, are easy, and eventually you come out of this industrial slump. In the U.S., um, you know, I was mentioning earlier that, um, um, you know, so, so I'm a researcher, but I have a Bloomberg terminal on my desk. And you can't help but look at it, you know, on and off. And basically, one of the critical things I have to do is amid the hundreds and thousands of news articles all day, I have to throw away 99% of them because they're a waste of time. And I just have to stick to the fundamentals. The probability of recession is pretty low here. 
Okay. Um, yes, the yield curve's flat, but the intermediation process is fine, and and there are no major imbalances in the economy. The the the, the, econ the U.S. economy is in pretty good shape. Now, let me turn to. You know, a, a, point, a point you made. I have a handout that I can pass out later, and I have this neat little chart where I show all whole bunch of different countries in the world, and their um, and and their their debt from from three months to thirty years, and the red are those with negative rates. And so we live in this regime with negative and ultra low rates. And so let's first ask the question, why are they negative? And you could say, okay, there's weaker economic growth and uncertainties, and that lowers the, um, you know, a, a real rate. There's lower expectations of inflation. But even when you get a market-based uh, measure of inflationary expectations and subtract it from market rates, so you get an ex-ante real expected rate of return, it's... It's wildly negative. And my feeling is, and I feel strongly about this, the reason why rates are negative, particularly in Europe, is the ECB has negative rates, the BOJ, the Swiss National Bank, the Swedish National Bank. So it's not only they're imposing negative rates and engage, holding very large balance sheets, Okay, but as importantly as that is there for the forward guidance that central banks are providing to financial markets encourages portfolio managers to to buy more. Okay, so so consider the following: the ECB up until this week had minus forty basis points and excess reserves through the banking system, but they signal clearly. Um, we're going to ease further, we're going to lower rates further, and we're going to do anything in the world to keep, you know, where the financial backs up. So why not buy Italian bonds even though they yield 90 basis points on 10 years? Why not lend money to the Italian government and get 90 basis points? The, the reason why you do it is you can take the positive carry. In fact, Italian banks, Italian commercial banks, can borrow money at negative rates from the ECB. Okay, they can buy Italian banks, take the positive carry, and they know the ECB is going to be the financial mm -hmm. backstop. Because if the ECB is not the financial backstop, then Europe's out of business and the ECB the people go home. Okay, so, so we can expect these negative rates to last for a while, and then portfolio managers, whether you're a, 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 a pension fund or an insurance fund in Japan or... Uh, or Europe, um, you look at the U.S. and you say, pretty attractive. And so that's driving down U.S. rates. We're going to be here for a while. So if you ask what's going to lead us out of this, these low rates, it's not going to be central banks because I study central banks. I, I know most of the policymakers and talk with them. Um, um, the Fed's model is not working um, the ECB's model is not working, but their models are telling them ease further. But if you think about it logically, let's take Europe as an example. Let's list the factors that are harming the European economy. Trade uncertainties, China's slowdown, Brexit, Italy. These are as much supply constraints as they are affecting a slowdown in demand, monetary policy is an aggregate demand tool. It is physically impossible for the ECB to do anything to offset these weaknesses. So the ease just creates more excess liquidity in the system, and now we have these negative rates. By the way, the negative rates don't apply to uh, retail, retail accounts, in, in, to only wholesale accounts. Now, what are the implications of all this? Okay. It imposed the negative and ultra low rates impose negative returns on savers. It penalizes savers. It encourages debt. It encourages more misguided fiscal policies. Okay. It distorts financial intermediation and 
makes decisions very, very difficult. Now, I mentioned at the outset, corporate profits in the U.S. are high. Um, by the way, the, the Schiller Cape is not a good predictor. Um, um, but U.S. corporations are in good shape, and as it's, it's not just the level of bond yields. The longer they stay low, portfolio managers either use a dividend discount model or you use opportunity costs, and that's pushing up PEs. Okay. The, the real head scratcher is what kind of discount rate do you use when evaluating European stocks when you've got a neg negative rates? Um, but uh, now, um, so uh, let me bounce back to China. Um, I actually think uh, there, a deal is going to be agreed upon, a partial deal. Now, keep in mind, China and the U.S. are the world's two biggest superpowers in, on so many dimensions. What do superpowers do? They fight with each other. Okay, the difference between China-U.S. versus the Cold War and, and U.S.-Soviet Union is there was no trade. There was nothing we wanted out of the Soviet Union. They didn't have production plants. They didn't have low unit labor costs. They, didn't, they weren't the center of the world's uh, 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 supply chains, okay? But the U.S. and China are the world's biggest traders and biggest traders with each other. Um, and besides the, the, them stealing intellectual property from us, just like we stole from the British you know, a couple hundred years ago, um, there's a lot of intellectual exchange going on now that we need and they need. So how do you keep the good stuff while eliminating the bad stuff? And, okay, so I was in Washington last week. Yes, progress is being made. When you go underneath all the headlines of President Trump and his erratic behavior and unpresidential behavior, you have some extraordinarily capable people who know the details inside and out who are working behind the scenes, um, they could agree very quickly on some of the trade issues, not the other issues. The, the critical issue now is um, China is willing to sign on to this notion of no more stealing of intellectual property. Um, the issues are um, how do you enforce it? And the U that's why China, China walked away in May. It's on enforcement. And then how does China agree to this without admitting guilt that they've done it in the past? That's the critical issue. I know it's the critical issue on the inside of the debate. And I would say you're going to get some breakthrough. But even if you get an agreement, and like if I go back to my office and you see <laughs> Uh, Trump and Xi are hugging each other and their best friends and an agreement's been struck. Don't expect global trade volumes to bounce back right away because China's slowing structurally. Expect the uh, Chinese want to depreciate, okay? You're gonna have, it's just a new regime with a lot of things are, are changing. So we're in this extremely interesting environment and let me end on one point as we look to 2020. Um, if I had to identify the biggest <clears throat> risk, so I say, you know, cautiously stay long bonds. I remember Steve, when I was here a couple years ago in early 2017, I said, ignore President Trump's tweets, just go long. And um, I, the biggest risk right now is, and I don't think markets are focusing on it, maybe because you can't focus on it, and that is the presidential elections are only 15 months away, and I don't know, I'm not a political analyst, but, you know, if we, I mean, if President Trump is reelected, the markets will kind of know what to expect, you know, the public and the media may get very upset. Um, if we get a, a moderate Democrat, um, 
then I think you know things will be okay because business executives will broker a deal on you know modest increases in corporate taxes if 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 the new administration agrees to you know keep some of the deregulations in in pace in place and, and markets love compromise. But if you do get a shift to the hard left, um, this could be a, a dramatic shift. And the U.S. is not used to the hard left. Um, and so when we think about it, if we listen to what some of the candidates from the hard left are proposing, um, break up the big banks. Well, that would be disruptive, but that would still be okay. We, there, there'd be in, disintermediation and all that. Um, but breaking up the social media firms, which are like the, not only the biggest growth companies, but they're, they're also the incubators for the biggest advances in technological innovation in the country. Um, um, one hard left candidate talked about st stopping all oil and shale production. Um, so the markets would react and then they'd think about it. So I'm, how do you put probabilities on this? You can't, but we're gonna have to, and we're not gonna, because pollsters don't know any more than any of us about who's gonna win, you're gonna have to wait. But this is, this is a, a when I think about risks, um, you know, uncertainties have good sides as well as bad sides, but but that that's a that's a, a, a true risk, and um, I'll leave that up to the portfolio. Let me ask you a question, Mickey. I'll leave that up to you. Yeah, leave it up to Mark. <laughs> pass the pass that hot potato. Quick, quick question. You mentioned that the the, uh, the negative rates. Is there a real danger, a risk of the the D word of deflation? In this scenario, in any scenario that seems reasonably likely, no. Okay, so let me take your question and and answer that and another one. Why hasn't all of the Fed's stimulus, QE, low rates? Why hasn't it generated higher inflation? Okay, and the reason is inflation's generated when you have excess demand relative to productive capacity. And the bottom line is all of the Fed stimulus has not worked to generate an acceleration in total dollar spending in the economy. So nominal GDP remains fairly modest, okay, which doesn't provide business pricing power to raise prices. And so inflation is below the Fed's 2% target um, because there's, you know, you don't have a lot of excess demand out there. Meanwhile, productive capacity keeps increasing in efficiencies that are reflected in, in, our, in, the, in the way the Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, you know, measures the inflation data in a quality adjusted way. Deflation would occur, can, can only occur when you have insufficient demand relative to productive capacity. So if you think about in the U.S., if you think potential growth, real growth is, say, two and a quarter percent based on, you know, productivity and, and labor force growth, then the way you get deflation is nominal spending growth has to fall below two percent on a, on a sustained basis, just like Japan has had bouts of deflation because it's nominal spending, you know, total yen spending is, has been below zero, which means every time you get a retail sales number or whatever number, it's, it's a negative. And that's how you get it. I don't think there's a probability of deflation. But on the other hand, I don't see inflation rising. And then my bottom line is, just because interest rates are really low, they, they are distorting things. And, you know, the longer yields stay really, really low in Europe, I mean, it's just plain scary that the policymakers are promoting these negative rates as a way to stimulate the economy. I, I really worry that 
you know, one of these days the ECB says we're going to ease the lift expectations and stimulate the economy, and financial market participants are going to say, no mas, we're out of here. Just like one, let me give you one final point. Japan, the BOJ owns almost 50% of all outstanding JGBs, government debt. They're buying more than 100% of deficit spending. They own 75%, this is the Bank of Japan, own 75% of all the ETFs on the Nikkei. And the PEs on the Nikkei have gone down since mid-2015. We don't want to get into that scenario. <laughs> well, first, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming today. Uh, I know we're all busy, so taking time out from uh, a busy schedule, it, it's nice to see a, a large group here. Second, I, I do feel like I should be sitting on a telephone book. <laughs> this makes me feel like I'm you back in St. James <laughs> Catholic grade school. There's four things that come up uh, amongst our clients, and our clients are endowments and foundations that they ask about, very similar to some of the themes that Mickey was talking about. The, the four-hour Brexit, what the hell is going to happen there? Uh, the inversion of our yield curve, China, and inflation. So I'll go through those. First, let's start with Brexit. We now all have heard the term prorogue. I actually had never heard that before. I had to look it up in the Merriam-Webster's dictionary to find out what it meant. Uh, the actual definition is a prorogue is to suspend by royal decree or royal prerogative. So this does seem like it's something that's peculiar or unique to the British parliamentary system. So Boris Johnson, the current PM, has declared a prorogue. Basically, he suspended parliament. Uh, and the reason for this is he is hell-bent on going for a hard Brexit, basically driving the car off the cliff or straight into the wall. Now, why is he doing this? Well, it's a populist thing to do but it's tearing that nation apart. Uh, to put it in perspective, uh, I don't know if any of you know this, but Boris Johnson has a brother, Joe Johnson. Uh, actually, it's spelled J-O as opposed to J-O-E as we would here in the US. His brother is an MP, so another member of parliament. His brother has resigned his seat just in the last few weeks. Why? Because his brother is in favor of going back for a second referendum, which is mean going back to the people and saying, do you really want to do this? Because he doesn't want Brexit. So you actually have Boris Johnson's own family splitting apart and his brother resigning over it. So who's this going to be bad for? If we get to a hard Brexit, which is what Boris Johnson still drives to, who's going to be penalized the most? Unfortunately, it's going to be the UK. If you look at UK's exports in 2018, 48% of their exports went to the EU. In 2017, it was 52% of their exports went to the EU. So that's about half their exports going to the EU right now under this uh, long-standing brokered agreement they have with the EU. Uh, on any given year, that's 11 to 13 percent of the overall GDP of the UK. Now you're going to go to hard Brexit. You're going to drive the car into the wall, break up all those trade agreements when 11 to 13 percent of your, your annual GDP is tied to your trade with that partner. That's a very ugly scenario for the UK. Let's, let's look at it from the EU side. Only about 6 to 8% of EU exports go to the UK, and only accounts for overall 2 to 3% of the overall GDP of the EU. Much smaller impact. So again, who's it going to be worse for if we have this hard Brexit? Definitely it's going to be much worse for the UK than it will be for the EU. And we really don't see much of a ripple effect coming over to the US or the rest of the world. So it's a shame to see. Uh, let's see what happens when we get to October 14th and the prorogue is over. It does seem like Boris Johnson's um, majority is dissipating very quickly because no one really does want to drive the car off the cliff. That's crazy. But if it does happen, it's going to be localized to the UK. There'll be a small ripple effect over to the EU, and that's about it. We don't really see it impacting our portfolios. So we're not too worried about that. Uh, let's move on to inversion of the US yield curve. Now, we just saw this happen. We saw the, the one-month T-bill higher than the 30-year Treasury bond just in the last month. You know, we haven't seen that in a long, long time. Now, why does that scare us? Well, the inversion of the yield curve has predicted with great accuracy the last five economic recessions in the United States. Fortunately, there's a six to nine-month time lag before that recession hits. Now, there's a key here. That yield curve has to remain inverted. 
which means you have to have a willing Fed to say, yeah, let's let the yield curve stay inverted, keep short rates up and low rates down. That's not happening here. We've just seen it happen. We've just seen a rate cut. We saw a rate cut in July. The Fed's trying to equalize that and bring the short rates down and push the long rates back up. So we have a Fed here who is not willing to let the yield curve stay inverted. So that's what's different this time. So we're less concerned about that than we normally would be when we see the inversion of the yield curve. In fact, a question I'd like to kick back to, to Mickey in a moment is we're less worried about our own yield curve. Back to some of the points Mickey was making. If you look at the yield curve at other large developed countries, Japan, of course, but look at Germany. Their whole yield curve is underwater. And by that, I mean is their absolute rates are all negative right now. That means if you buy a German bond today and you hold it to maturity, you're guaranteed a loss. You are paying the government money for them to take their money, your money from you. Who thinks that's a good investment idea? Show of hands. <laughs> Who here would pay the US government money for them to take their money from you? That's what's happening in Germany. It's crazy. Now, clearly, the ECB has overstepped their policy bounds, I think, on this one. But that's the situation you have right now. These are no longer bonds in Germany. These are insurance policies. You're buying the bond today with a guaranteed loss because you're, getting, you're being insured that you're going to get that money back. So you're paying an insurance premium. Now, why does that concern me? When bonds turn into insurance premiums, that shows an underlying lack of confidence in the economy. And actually, you've seen that in, in the economic returns. If you look at the return to stocks over the last two years, year over year, year over the last two years in Germany, basically across Europe and the UK, it's flat. You know, we're up another good 20% this year. You put the last two years together in Europe, 2018, 2019, you're basically still at zero. So in terms of where we're playing our money, you know, we still like the US over, over Europe. Um, we still like uh, emerging markets, but we're playing that more in the private equity space than we are in the public equity space. Uh, let's move on to inflation. We saw a slight blip, you know, a little blip up to about 2.4% in core inflation. But by the way, here's another point I love. I love it when economists, excuse me, Mickey, no offense, say, <laughs> oh, just look at core inflation. Forget about energy and food. Let's put that to a side. I'm like, you know what? I got to pay for that energy and food. Why are we putting that to the side? I still got to eat that inflation. So, you know, when inflation, what economists say, oh, no, forget about oil <coughs> and energy and food costs. It's like, what are they thinking? We still got to pay for that. We, so we've seen a small blip up in inflation recently, but we're not too worried about that. Again, that's headline inflation, CPI. And Mickey's right. The Fed does look at PC, personal consumption expenditures, and that's been ticking along a little less than 2%, pretty consistent. Where are we worried about inflation? It's not inflation, it's deflation. We are worried about that in China. Uh, all of you have Bloomberg screens, or most of you have access to it, I'm sure. Mickey does. And by the way, looking at Bloomberg during the day is addicting. It's hard to think long term when you're looking at your Bloomberg screen, I have to admit to that. But look up the PPI, not the CPI, but the producer price index in China. Go back from 2011 to 2017, that was negative. Year in, year out, month in, month, month out. That's deflation. Now, why do we look at that? Our view is that the Chinese government is very good at massaging numbers. And by the way, headline in CPI inflation was positive through all, all that time period, but PPI, which we think is a much more real indicator, was negative. And what happened in the middle of 17? Suddenly, the PPI went from a minus 8% in a matter of two months to a plus 6%, a 14% swing. Now, that doesn't happen in the natural economic world. What happened is China finally caught on that people were no longer looking at CPI, they were looking at PPI. And lo and behold, deflation vanished, and it went back up to being positive. Now, why is that a problem? We all point to Japan and saying, look how badly they've managed their debt. We all point to Greece and say, look how badly they've managed their debt. They're the poster children for bad debt management. China is the most indebted nation in the world. 250% debt to outstanding GDP. <coughs> Deflation is a big deal when you're the most indebted nation in the world. Another problem with deflation, if you're trying to build a consumption economy, which is what China is trying to do, it's trying to move from an export economy to a consumption economy like we are, like the UK, like all developed countries, people aren't going to consume if you have deflation. Why? Well, two reasons. You're not going to buy today what's going to be cheaper tomorrow. You will postpone that. You will defer it. The second big ingredient to consumption is consumer debt, credit card debt, loans car loans, whatever. 
you're not going to take out debt if you have deflation, because from the moment you take out that loan, it's going to inflate on you and in a deflationary environment. You won't take out debt. That's going to kill consumption. China's got a very big problem. They're going to have to figure that out. Uh, and then what was my last one? Oh, the China, just the, the global trade wars. Uh, you know, it's fascinating when you look at, look at trade wars. In, in times of actual military conflict with our enemies, what do our enemies do? They blockade our ports to prevent the free flow of trade of goods. In times of peace, what do we do? We impose tariffs. The fascinating thing, our tariffs are self-inflicted blows to ourself, to our own economy. So right now, in the U.S., we now have tariffs on over 5,700 goods coming in from China. Everything from cultured pearls to, get this, parachutes. All of you, all those of you in the audience who are skydivers, check your parachute next time you jump out of a plane. <laughs> this is crazy. Look at pork. China has imposed a 10% tariff on pork from the U.S. Now, why is that crazy? China is the largest consumer of pork in the world. We are the largest producer and exporter of pork in the world. If pork is the biggest staple of your diet in China, you want to buy that as cheaply as possible. But here you are putting a 10% tariff on it and artificially raising the price to your end consumers, your population, from your biggest supplier of pork. Again, that's crazy. When we look at the, the trade wars right now, uh, in fact, going back several months ago, we had estimated that it was going to be a drag of 30 to 50 basis points on U.S. GDP and maybe 80 to 120 basis points for China GDP. We're at the top end of those estimates right now. We think it's going to trim off half a percent of GDP in the U.S. and over a full percent in China if these trade wars continue. That does worry us. Uh, so we hope that China and Trump and these very smart people that are behind Trump, touch wood, will come to their senses and come to some trade agreement. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mark. Uh, just one question. Uh, if you were to hedge your portfolio right now against the possibility of a recession, what would you use? And where, you know, where would you see that as being practical and economical? Uh, so, you know, I get a lot of questions, for instance, about gold. Uh, should we own gold? Uh, the fact is, is, if you own gold, there's no economic return to gold. Uh, people argue with me this all the time, but there's no cash flow associated with it. There's no risk premium associated like stocks or bonds or credit. So gold is an insurance policy. Basically, it's a dead weight loss. There's no expected return to it. It's simply what someone else may pay for it. Gold does hedge you. It tends to go up in value when we hit a recession. But before you hit that recession, there's no economic return to gold. So what you're doing is you're converting part of your portfolio, let's say stocks, which do have an equity risk premium and a dividend yield to it, to gold, which is uh, an asset that doesn't provide you with any return, just as an insurance policy in case things go bad. We don't allocate to gold at the Kalman Fund. Uh, we still believe in bonds, uh, and we are looking less at treasuries, but more at corporate bonds, AAA, AA, and single A. Uh, for taxable investors, and I know there are a lot of family offices here, uh, it's building a laddered portfolio of tax-exempt uh, municipal bonds from highly rated uh, uh, towns, cities, municipalities, and states. Uh, because, again, bonds aren't particularly tax uh, effective. But bonds do are still are a shock absorber. The, the thing that people don't like about bonds right now, they're like, oh my god, rates are so low. Well, you know what? We had it good for 30 years. For 30 years, we had a bond party where you bought a bond and our Fed kept bringing interest rates down, 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 down for 30 years, which meant bond prices kept going up, 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 up for 30 years. So you got to have your insurance policy, and you got to have your cake, too, because it kept appreciating the value. Okay, well, that party's over. The, the Fed came in, took all the Budweiser away. Uh, rates aren't really going to go down much lower than they are today, but bonds will still be a good shock absorber, and you are getting a little bit of yield to go with that. And again, we look at corporate bonds over Treasury bonds right now. Uh, follow on to that idea in a way, uh, and some of your other comments. Uh, Allocators have been allocating to international investing for 30, 40, 50 years now. Uh, is that allocation now obsolete? Are we going to back to home bias uh, because we like the U.S. so much more than the Eurozone and Japan and China? Uh, well, well, I'll start then. I'd love to get Mickey's thoughts on this, too. Yeah, there's something out there that, that we've written about at the Common Fund. We call it the ACWI fatigue. ACWI is the all-country world index. It's the global stock market index. 
and uh, a number of our clients are benchmarked to ACWI, a global economic portfolio. And the reason why we call it the ACWI fatigue is ACWI has underperformed the S&P 500 for the last six or seven years. And so people are tired of allocating globally when, when the home buy seems to be the, the smart bet. The fact is, is we still believe in the global economy. Uh, we just say, take, for instance, the auto industry. You still just have, you know, basically three main auto manufacturers now in the U.S. or domestic. Uh, Ford, GM, I don't include Chrysler, they're owned by the Italians. Uh, Tesla is our third auto manufacturer in the U.S. nowadays. So if you're investing just on a domestic buy, you only have three auto companies you'd pick from. But if you look globally, Toyota, Hyundai, BMW, uh, even Jaguar, Volkswagen. Volkswagen. So on a global basis, the opportunity set is much bigger and broader. Uh, that, uh, being mindful of what I said earlier, is right now we're uh, slightly overweight U.S. versus other developed markets. Uh, we do like emerging markets, but we like emerging markets in the private space through private capital or venture capital more than we like the public markets. Uh, this holds true primarily in China, Latin America, and a few other emerging market countries where we see the private markets to be the better opportunity set right now than the public markets. And I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay. Mickey, want to comment on that last point? Wow. Um, my, my assessment is, once again, China's growth, even if they stimulate it, will come back some, but it's decelerating. And you have to think about, when I think about EM, um, you have to break it down country by country and understand what you're getting into. Um, India's fundamentals are solid, sound, and very positive for the future. Um, but many other EM depend on global trade flows, um, and I'd be very, very cautious. I would look at EM in a portfolio more as kind of, except for India and maybe a few others, as opportunistic that you may not want to be in for the long run. Um, and there are some interesting opportunities out there, but you have to be nimble. And then you also have to consider the implications of the dollar, which has been firm, that steers capital away from EM. And on, on the dollar, all I can say is um, doesn't always follow what analysts think it's going to do. Um, it's been solid. There's been capital flowing into the U.S. because of the high, higher rates and the more reliable central bank and the like. But you've really got to be cautious. And if you really like speculation, even play, when you think about uncertainties, even places like Venezuela are interesting. But it's not, they're not for the faint of heart. But, but when you analyze EM, you've really got to break it down and go country by country. Tough, yeah. tough issue. I absolutely agree with that. You know, we used to talk about the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, as if they were one conglomerate. You just put your money, allocate out that. You can't do that anymore. You really do have to be very clear about what your investment theme or thesis is on a country by country basis. Not only why, whether you like that country, uh, let's say Brazil over Russia, over India, over China, why you like that country. And then again, are you going to play that country through the public markets or through the private markets? You have to be very clear in your thesis nowadays. I, I loved your point about uh, um, investing th in the private markets mm -hmm. because the public markets, even even a, uh, you know a lot of these countries, if you look at the the public markets, the you know the big companies are overweighted in the indices, and the, and the big companies tend to be have biases in them. If you can dig underneath the surface to what's really driving the economies, that's where you can, you can do well. Mark, we should be, be concerned about the decrease in the number of public issuance uh, in the stock market here? Uh, I think the people who should be most concerned about that are those who are passively mandated. Uh, whether you're allocating capital out to index funds or ETFs, the, the pool of companies to, to which they're allocating is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking which means more and more capital is getting crowded into that. So talk about a momentum trade. Uh, a lot of that momentum trade, by the way, uh, of passive is coming from primarily the retail side. Uh, and that's been a one-way trade up over the last decade. In fact, over the last 15, 16 years, 
uh, going back to the popping of the tech bubble even longer. Uh, my question is, you know, it used to be that when you invested in an ETF, uh, let's say the, the S&P Spider, and that was the original ETF, that was a way to get liquidity. Buy one stock and you got this access to the whole S&P, so great liquidity. But the ETF and, and passive market has grown so, bu so big, they no longer are liquidity suppliers, they're liquidity absorbers. They're taking liquidity away and because of this one-way trade up. Now, what happens when that trade rolls over? Who's going to supply liquidity to them? I don't know the answer to that. Now, that's going to get ugly because I don't think they do either. So shrinking number of stocks out there for the passive and ETF market, that's a big problem. It's creating even more momentum-driven trading at some point will roll over, and when it rolls over, it's going to roll over big, and it's going to get ugly fast. So do we, we, if that happens, uh, will that focus shift to value at that point, or is that just a faint hope? Yeah, is value dead, right? You know, it, it, has it been buried? Is there a tombstone over it? By the way, uh, quick show, how many people, you know, allocate capital to value managers? Let's see if there are any... Oh, well, God bless you. There are some brave souls in the audience. <laughs> Hang in there. Long-term investors. We at our investment committee at Common Fund just went through an extensive debate over this a few months ago. Uh, we have allocated a, a capital to a, a number of quantitative managers, managers like Two Sigma, Martin Gale, uh, World Quant, uh, who are quantitatively driven using artificial intelligence, big data, looking for, quote, these nonlinear relationships that you can't uh, – uh, normally see through uh, traditional economic theory. Nonetheless, we're still committed to value. At the end of the day, if you're going to buy a stock or any asset class, there has to be some economic return associated with that. And that return has to be tied to a cash flow at some point in time. And you have to get your money back at some point, unless you're in Germany and you're buying bonds and you're just saying, out oh, the hell with it. But at some point, you do expect to get some cash flow or return back on your capital. And therefore, having some sense of whether investing or buying that asset today is cheap relative to those expected cash flows in the future, that's still the basis of value investing. And we're not throwing in the towel on that. We still believe in that. Good. All right. Could, could, can I? Yeah, please. I want to add this point and maybe elicit a discussion on when you think about value and you're, you're a, a portfolio manager. Um, and you think about value and, and in this environment of uncertainty, preserving real principle, um, um, how should you incorporate current bond yields and your expectations of bond yields into your perception of value and the sustainability of principle? Okay, and, and, and I think the, a point I'm making there is, once again, if you perceive that inflation is going to stay low or, as you say, there's, you know, okay, stay low. We don't, we don't need to go into detail. And bond yields are going to stay pretty low in this regime, then that should change your perception of what value is. And it should also, in this environment, it's also changing the perspective of CEOs and what they expect for top line and bottom line growth and how they value that top and bottom line growth in this environment of low inflation and low bond yields. And I think this is an important. So when I talk about regimes that we're in, we're in this regime and you know, unfortunately, we're no longer in the regime where, you know, inflation is going to go back to three or four and you could get six and a half or seven percent on, on on a triple A bond fund. So I, I just wanted wanted to bring bring out this kind of conceptual thinking about value, even though I know you were talking about value in a different way. I think using that word, I think, needs to be reassessed here yeah yeah great well it certainly is a test to long-term investors to try to stay the course because uh, i was listening to hiro mizuno who was heading the japan gpif he said last quarter of last year was the first time in his memory that everything went down and he said it with almost a, a, a literally you could hear the you could hear the concern the depression almost in his voice uh, 
So we really are in a different regime from an allocator standpoint than we were before. And you could go back one year, you could go back 20 years, and it, it, it has changed. Very difficult <laughs> to get to, to figure out correlations now and whether you're going to be able to get uncorrelated return. So let's go to the audience and get some questions. Uh, we, have an, we have some good, uh, I'm sure, some good questions. Yes. Could you comment on debt and deficits? Now and in the future, the effect mm -hmm. of that on, mm -hmm. the, on interest rates, ability to fight inflation. Go ahead. Let, let me take that. Okay. The answer is yes, but perhaps differently than we've been taught to fear. Okay. So, by the way, I'm I'm a fiscal analyst. I just met with the new head of the Congressional Budget Office two days ago in Washington. Okay, so for four decades, since the 1970s, we've been taught, oh, deficits are going to increase inflation, deficits are going to increase interest rates. That hasn't happened. Okay, and there's some conceptual reasons why it hasn't, and I, you know, the, the, I, I mean, I emphasize that you're not going to get higher inflation, you know, unless monetary policy starts to stimulate aggregate demand. Um, you look at anybody's projections of long-run deficits and they're going up and U.S. debt is going up. That need not generate higher inflation. It need not generate higher interest rates depending on, you know, expected rates of return and global flows. The point I would emphasize is when you think about deficits, it's not, don't think about deficit spending and total debt per se, but what your deficit spending on. And so what we see in the United States is it's absolutely clear, and anybody could support this with data, is the vast majority of the deficit spending and the vast majority of the increase in debt is, is deficit spending for um, income support programs and a small and shrinking portion of government spending um, is for, let's call it, activities that increase productive capacity. So the point I'm making to you is, yes, I think about deficits. I think they're having a sizable impact on the allocation of national resources. Okay. And economic performance and when I hear people say oh um, sometime in the future deficits are going to come back to bite us and I would say the future's now okay um, if we had debt to GDP now the way we had it in 2007, when it was 35% of GDP rather than 80 and rising, we literally two years ago would have been talking about an, an infrastructure spending program that we desperately need in the 20 billion range over 10 years. So the the future is now, and it's the, so don't think about deficits per se and debt and all that and how it's going to drive up interest rates. It's having a decided impact on what I urge the Congressional Budget Office to do, and I, I'm, I'm an advisor there, is to um, write a study, conduct a serious study for Congress, and teach Congress that um, just because inflation's low and interest rates are low doesn't mean that deficit spending is costless. You're not a fan of MMT, I take it. Um, okay, so what, one question, you know, when asked, okay, so if you did get um, in, in the presidential election a hard left president, what would be a good defensive sector? And my scary tongue-in-cheek answer is buy infrastructure stocks and construction stocks because there would be, you know, a 10 or $20 billion infrastructure spending legislation that would be financed by um, the Federal Reserve, siphoning money off from the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And if that ha happens, 
which has happened in a small amount in the past, the Fed can't do anything about it. A new WPA. Hmm. Basically. Yeah, so, so uh, this happened in 2015 where a, a, a highway trust fund bill um, um, to, 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 to re-ramp up the, 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 the amount in the highway trust fund um, the, the Congress slipped in that they would take $30 billion from the Fed. And um, once again, the Fed can't do anything about it except for complain publicly. And, and uh, Yellen was too scared to say anything because the Fed's chartered by Congress. Another question, yes. Yeah, if you had to sort of assess the, the views of central bankers, how much is, is kind of standard we're trying to manage a process of, of levers to manage normal growth deflation trade-offs. How much is fear of losing social license because of general political uh, anger about the effects of uh, financial markets and income distribution since the Great Recession? And how much do you think there's a real fear that once if something were to go in terms of a uh, debt deflation or a downturn, they would really have a serious to share in debt deflation problem on their hands. Boy, that's a that's a big question. I would say that, like the Fed and the ECB, that the Fed has a dual mandate, but it's very the dual the two mandates are the inflation mandates very carefully defined two percent. The maximum employment is very undefined. Um, the Fed. Its primary focus is on that mandate, but they've changed their reaction to things to the point that now their perception is as long as inflation is below 2%, let's continue to stimulate. And due to political and social pressures, they really want to avoid any signs of recession, so they're willing to tilt toward ease. Um, add into that pressures from President Trump that are just, um, we've had prior presidents put pressure on the Fed, but this, what he's doing is absolutely inappropriate. And the Fed won't talk about it. They won't even talk about it at their private meetings because they, don't, they know it'll show up in the minutes five years later. But do they hear footsteps? Yeah. And so central bankers are, and I, sp I speak to all of them all the time from here to Tokyo, and they're very well intentioned. Um, and they're, they're really trying to carry out their mandates, but the Fed has this exceedingly unhealthy relationship with financial markets. They're scared of a stock market decline. They want to avoid recession because they know, should a recession unfold for any reason, the Fed would get blamed. And, and but then there are things lurking under the surface. Uh, these ultra low rates there, and what the Fed's doing is increasing wealth inequality and increasing income inequality. Because think about all of us own homes. Low rates push up the value of long-lived assets, including real estate. Lower income people tend to rent. Their rental value, their rental costs go way up. The Fed doesn't like to talk about this. And so central bankers are really in a bind and the bind they're in now is largely created by them because they have convinced markets and the media and the public that, oh, whenever anything goes wrong, you know, the, the, the central banks should ease and then everything will be okay. <laughs> Help me out. <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, the, the Fed and, and central banks are even the scapegoats or the saviors. Uh, back to the policy question, and uh, it's hard to, to uh, when you talk about the Fed or any central banker, not to bring some politics into the room. So put aside, you know, whatever your feelings are about President Trump. 
uh, whether you think he's a great president or bad or smart or dumb, he's at least smart enough to recognize one thing, which is standing or sitting presidents don't get toppled by political opponents. They get toppled by bad economies. He knows to get reelected, he's got to keep this economy moving along. That's one of the reasons why he's putting a lot of pressure on the Fed to reduce rates even faster further. He wants the full 1%. I mean, we all read the headlines. He knows he's got to keep this economy percolating along if he's going to get reelected. And he apparently wants to be reelected. So I think he will see this continued pressure on the Fed. What I also find fascinating is it seems now a bit like the tail wagging the dog. It used to be the markets reacting to what the Fed does. But nowadays, again, back to your Bloomberg screen, you know, type WIRP and look at what are the implied Fed rate cuts. It almost seems like the Fed is now forced to fulfill what the market expects of them. So whatever expectation the market sets, the Fed now has to live up to that. Again, that's the tail wagging the dog. It should be the other way around. And I don't know how we break out of that cycle. Uh, I really don't. But we should expect the Fed to remain accommodating for a long period of time. You know, in fact, if you read their minutes coming out of the July meeting, uh, it was almost like they were looking to figure out, why did we just cut rates? Uh, and, and you read the minutes, and there's really nothing in there that says why they had to cut rates. I but, couldn't help myself. Yeah, it's, I just decided I needed to. And also look at the language that our, our Fed chairman is using right now. Back to December last year, he was talking about patience, patience in the market. That was the new buzzword. Now it's, quote, maintain the expansion. That's the new buzz phrase he's using. So you will continue to see this pressure in the US. I agree. I think most central bankers are all well-intentioned. My own personal opinion is that the ECB has overstepped their boundaries, which is why you have negative interest rates uh, across much of Europe right now. I don't think we go down that road here in the US. But I think if Donald Trump had his way, he might push us towards that limit. Ryan? I think you mentioned the partial agreement on trade. And I know you said you're not a political analyst, but between you, given the imperative to keep the economy going for Trump to be reelected, what's your what's the your inside view on what when and what that partial trade agreement looks like? One, and then two, I'd love to hear a little bit more granularity around some of these very capable people on the Trump because we see none of that. Right. Um Okay, so it's only speculation on, on timing, but there, there are a lot of things that China needs that the U.S. produces. You mentioned, you know, pork. You could also mention soybeans. You can also mention LNG. China's the biggest user of natural gas in the world, and they... They, re they know they rely way too much on Russia for it and, and, and a long-term contract with the U.S. And actually, the U.S. is gearing up their pipelines and trans transshipment ports to, to, to export to China. Um, so there, you, you could think of a whole list of products and services that China could import that the U.S. could export. And that would be, you know, and lower some of the tariffs and, and the U.S., of course, would love to have China agree, you know, agree with an amount. And that could, that could happen. The, the stickier issue is intellectual property and how to treat it. And this China behind the scenes agrees to that going forward, they're not going to require a, a foreign company doing a joint venture to turn over their intellectual property before they do anything. They're going to change. But um, they, they, once again, they don't want, they want to do so in a way where they don't admit guilt of what they've done in the past. And it's in the kind of fine print stage now. And so I, I don't know the timing, but I, I, you are going to get some kind of agreement. And keep in mind, China's economy is weakening. It has not responded to all the stimulus that's been thrown at it. Um, the Chinese leaders um, face economic pressures. And keep in mind, their export-related manufacturing sectors on the eastern provinces, uh, exports and imports are declining. Those are their high-paying jobs. If you have a job in the service industry in China, 
your wages are really low, but if you're in, in a manufacturing firm that's export, you're doing well, and they're cutting employment and wages are declining now. So they also face some major social issues that, that is putting a lot of pressure on the leadership. Read Hong Kong at all. And um, these are all adding up to, you know, Trump, um, you know, he, he could walk into a room and size everybody up and, and identify their weakness and go for the jugular. And he's, I think he's miscalculated things because he, it's gone on much longer than he had thought. It's gone on much longer than he had thought because the issues aren't just about trade. They're about two global superpowers going after each other. But they'll get some kind of resolution. But it's just going to be a partial resolution because superpowers fight with each other. Now, on the smart people, I mean, there are people in the U.S. Trade Representative's Office and, and the U.S. Treasury who really understand the issues inside and out. And so I was in Washington last December, and I wanted to meet with this one guy um, who's a high-level Treasury official who nobody knows about. Um, U.S. citizen, spent 10 years in Beijing, is a lawyer, knows law inside and out, speaks three dialects of Chinese, knows Chinese law, and they respect him. And he said, you know, when you're talking about trade, that's easy stuff. But when you're talking about intellectual property, it's a company by company, case by case basis where you're going and fighting it out in the trenches. And he says, we don't just go in naively. Uh, we take in teams from the trade, U.S. Trade Representative's Office who have dealt with China for 20 years. And keep in mind, uh, you know, President Clinton argued strenuously and fought to get China in the WTO because they, he said they'll start behaving under rules, and they failed. Then President Bush and Obama were fighting with China and urging them to open up, but they worked through you know, normal establishment channels like filing complaints with the WTO that took a long time. And China knows exactly how to deal with dipl international diplomats that act diplomatically. That is, they come to an agreement and then they go do whatever they want. Um, they have real trouble dealing with Trump, who's extraordinarily undiplomatic and unpredictable and doesn't work through normal channels. So once again, what it, what it involves is a, creating an environment where, where China knows it would be better off signing a deal. Trump knows his, he will be better off, but how do you create this environment where China can sign on to something where they could look good doing so. And you have people working on that. And I could tell you on tariffs, and I, you and I totally agree, tariffs are a tax. And somebody's got to bear the burden of that. And in the administration now, the vast majority of high-level officials think that it's improper to use higher tariffs as, as the lever. It just so happens the small minority of people who favor using tariffs include Trump and Navarro. And there have been some major battles. And, and so I, let's just hope this thing concludes and you break through on some of the tariff issues, which would you know, lift some of the uncertainties that are really tying up global supply chains. because the more ratcheting up of tariffs, the most recent research shows clearly that the biggest negative impact on U.S. and global corporations is the uncertainty related to the tariff policies rather than the tariffs per se. And so the quicker we break through some, so I'm, I'm kind of on the 
optimistic side that we get something done here, but it's not, when I say something done, it's just gonna be a partial resolution and then the superpowers will continue to fight over tons of other things. All right. Kurt, did you have a question? Do you still have time, just a real quick one? Yeah, no, go ahead, we have about time. About this, all of the discussion in yesterday's paper about this using this emergency power to prop up money market funds. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the terminology is, but they connected it to the fact that they haven't used it for 10 years, which is a pretty inauspicious connection uh, for, for lots of reasons. What, does that trouble you at all, or is there nothing to see here and move on? Or? That, that was just a pure technical operation um you know just the the cash flows in the money market in the short-term money markets um you had, you had insufficient supply because two things were happening um the treasury was issuing bonds taking money out of the economy at the same time there were some corporate tax payments and so it was just a, a short-term liquidity operation no harm no foul and and powell indicated that yesterday Greg. Yeah, Mark, just back on asset allocation, I'm just curious if you can elaborate on your attraction to private capital in light of today's market. Sure. Uh, a couple things. I'll answer the two different dimensions. I'd mentioned earlier how we like uh, private capital over uh, public markets uh, and emerging markets in general. Uh, when you look at China and India as an example, uh, we much prefer to play those markets through the venture capital. These are new economies that are coming online, and the entrepreneurship in India and China is amazing. Uh, we prefer that than the state-owned enterprises, for instance, in China that are, that are getting listed. Uh, but compare that, for instance, to Brazil. Brazil's not a, it's an emerging market, but it's not necessarily an emerging economy. The way you pr play private capital there is not through the venture capital market. It's through buyouts, private equity, leveraged buyouts, where family-owned businesses are, are the biggest generation generator of economic growth in Brazil. And so there, what you're doing is you're buying an existing company with existing cash flows from a family and then turning it into a, a private uh, venture from there. So again, looking at uh, emerging markets, you have to look at them differently. Uh, and we prefer to play emerging markets right now through the private side. Again, venture capital, India and China, for example, private equity in Brazil. Then in terms of asset allocation, yes, we keep getting the question, are we late cycle? The fact is, is how many people in this room, just quickly, are market timers, believe you can actually time the market perfectly? <laughs> yeah, we don't either. One of the things we look at at Common Fund is we look at the embedded risk premium across asset classes. So for instance, the, in the public equity markets, let's just take large cap stocks in the US, the long-term risk premium is about 4%. That's the risk premium you get for investing in public stocks here in the US over treasury bonds. Again, that's the long-term average. Right now, it's above 4%. We also look at the liquidity premium. You can actually track and measure that. And we, in fact, at the Common Fund have published a paper on how you can do that. The long-term average there is about 3.5%. And right now, in fact, private capital, the liquidity premium is right about 3.5%. It's still pretty juicy. Liquidity premium, by the way, is the premium you get over and above public markets. So that premium is still very strong. In terms of trying to time the markets, you have to believe that you can, one, time the markets, and then you can time the markets with illiquid asset classes versus liquid asset classes, and that's very hard to do. So we still believe in diversified private capital portfolios, which includes buyouts, venture capitals, co-investments, secondaries, and natural resources. And indeed, we were talking about value before. If you're looking for an underappreciated asset class right now, where PEs are low and asset prices are low, it's natural resources. And so we're looking at that very heavily within our private capital group. Uh, all that being said, right now we find the biggest interest uh, still is venture capital. Getting access to venture capital, very hard to do. Uh, very bluntly, if you don't have access now, you're unlikely ever to get it. You want access to Sequoia? At the time we got access to Sequoia, it was 20 years ago. Same thing for Benchmark or Kleiner Perkins, uh, which is what Common Fund did 20 years ago. So we still like venture capital, as do our clients, and our clients like secondaries right now. Uh, we still find secondaries to be an inefficient market. Uh, that's one place where we find a lot of good value. And in, uh, I'll stop there. Again, we believe in still a diversified portfolio. We're not trying to time the market with our private capital portfolio. In fact, that's the last place you want to do it. For long-term assets, they're going to last 10 to 12 years. 
Uh, and indeed, if you were going to try and time the market and you thought there was going to be a recession, the time to invest in private capital is now. Allocate your capital now so those private capital ventures can take advantage of declining asset values in the next, you know, four to six years. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Anybody? Yes. I guess, I'm sorry. Very quickly on, on the uh, fixed income allocation you mentioned. How are you managing your duration in this rate environment? Because if, if you think rates are going down, you might extend, but at the same time, we're so low. How do you, how do you think of your I'm going to repeat that question. Yeah, so the, the question was, Mark, if you are actually allocating the bonds, and oh my God, how boring is that? You know, how do you deal with it in, in a rate environment like this with rates are either so low or expected to go up? Uh, the fact is, is we are trying to look at shock absorbers. I call them shock absorbers across our, all of our parts of our portfolio. Bonds is one example. Uh, another example in real estate, there, there's uh, two parts of the real estate market we like a lot are one, assisted care and living, just tying into the demography of aging baby boomers, which is everything from concierge living, which that's a new one that I've learned about recently, <laughs> which is basically you buy a luxury condo and there's a, a doctor and medical staff on to you know, high care medical facilities. Uh, that we find to be uh, more, not recession proof, but recession resistant. Also storage is another area that we've been buying a lot in. When you have a recession, people don't buy homes, they shrink their apartments, and they put a lot of things in storage. So that's just a demonstration of one asset class where we're playing that. Uh, the secondaries market back to private capital. Again, not recession proof, but good recession resistant. In terms of that, if, if asset classes do decline, you'll be able to pick them up in the secondaries market with some expectation of being cheap. Back to the bond market. We're not trying to time interest rates, but our duration is close to the, the Barclays Bloomberg aggregate, which is about a, a duration of about six years. It's pretty long. It's actually fascinating when you look, though, at that. How many people are familiar with the, uh, the Barclays Bloomberg BlackRock Lehman aggregate <laughs> through all of its names? It's the standard benchmark in the, in the fixed income world. If you go back to the Great Financial Recession, right before that, the average duration on that index was about three years and the yield was six. Now the duration on that is six and the yield is actually a little lower than three. It's kind of flip-flopped around. So bonds are really hard to play if you're looking for a good, juicy return. We like them as a natural shock absorber to the portfolio. Not only that, it gives us a call option on liquidity. You know, we're, we're not, our crystal ball, by the way, is just as murky and muddy as everyone else's. I wish it came in high definition. It doesn't. We do expect that there'll be some recession over the next two to four years. We can't predict when, nor can we prevent it. So the best thing to do for it is prepare for it. And having bonds is one way to do it. But again, it gives us that call option on liquidity because we do intend to go out and be active buyers when the markets do have a decline. When asset prices get cheap, we like to be liquidity providers to the market and buy those assets at their lower prices. Other ways that we look at trying to supplement our bond portfolio is through hedge funds. We run a close to zero beta hedge fund portfolio, zero beta to equities, credit adjusted duration, and duration adjusted credit. So zero beta across those three primary beta components. We find that to be a very good shock absorber. And I know this sounds crazy. I was waiting for a year like 2018 to come along when all the stock markets around the world declined. Our hedge fund portfolio was up 5%. Now, again, I don't want to happen every year, but it proved the concept of what we're trying to do with hedge funds and bonds to be shock absorbers, to give us some buffering to the portfolio. That was a long-winded answer, but I hope that helped. Good. Good.